Apostle to all of you. And today I want to also greet in a special way our Chilean delegation because today is the feast of the patroness of Chile, Our Lady of Mount Carmel. So we have to remember all of you, our Chileans, and all of us who have served in Chile. Uh, it's a special day for all of us. Congratulations. Pope Francis told a story about something that he did in Buenos Aires when he was there as bishop, a leader of cardinal. A well-known priest who had been a great, one of these men who confessed so many priests in Buenos Aires, known as a good confessor, he died, and he was lying in state. And Jorge Gregorio went to pay his respects. And when he went into the church where this priest was laid out, he uh, noticed that there weren't any flowers. There was nothing was bare. There weren't any people there. And he said, I thought, this man forgave the sins of all the priests in Buenos Aires, but not a single flower. And so he went out and bought some roses and came and placed them around the coffin. And then he says, temptation struck. Immediately there came to mind the thief we have all have inside ourselves. And while I arranged the flowers around the coffin, I reached into the coffin and took the cross off of the rosary that the priest clapped in his hands. And he took the, ro the cross off the rosary and when he did so, he said, give me half of your mercy. And the Pope carries that cross in his pocket till this day. Give me half of your mercy. That's quite a confession coming from a Pope, isn't it? <laughs> mercy is a recurring theme of Pope Francis. He speaks so often about the need to be merciful. And he says it's not something which we do on a special occasion. It's something that has to be part of the fiber of our being. It's fundamental responsibility of the church and identifies us as Christians. When speaking to a group in St. In, in Peter's, the Pope said, every day situations arise which summon us to service. Every day, each one of us is called to be a comforter, to become a humble yet generous instrument of the providence of God and of his merciful goodness of his love which understands and shows compassion, of his consolation which gives relief and courage. Every day we are all called to become a caress of Christ. <coughs> For those who perhaps have forgotten their first caresses, or perhaps who never have felt a caress in their life. Mercy is, of course, a recurring theme in the scriptures as well. The word in German for mercy is barmherzigkeit. Barmherzigkeit. Herzig, Herzen. Heart, Corazon. Latin, misericordia. It's about the heart. Jesus reveals to us that compassionate heart of God. He embodies the compassion of God. And how many times do we hear in the scriptures, we read the scripture stories, that Jesus was moved to compassion. His very inner being was moved to compassion by the needs of others, by the suffering of others. And he had that compassion, he was moved to compassion for all people who had a need, but his special ones were those who were suffering some type of human misery, whether moral or spiritual, or sinners, those far off, the corrupt, or materially poor, those who lived in subhuman conditions. The compassion of Jesus sought their liberation. I have come, as we hear in Luke chapter 4, 
to free, to liberate, to give sight to the blind, to give a roof to those who are homeless. This is Jesus. This is God incarnated in flesh and blood, revealing to us God's inner heart, God's desire to love and to embrace. Jesus was present to people. It's hard to love a category. I love a category. Jesus loved people. And yet we put people into cate categories, and that, I think, is one of our problems in helping us to become more merciful, more compassionate. Because we talk about, well, that person's an alcoholic, or this person is gay, or she's divorced, or that couple's non-practicing, uh, non or this is a right-wing Tea Party Republican, or this is one of those flaming liberal Democrats, we're always doing that. We're always hanging our little little uh, etiquettes on one another. And that is one of the obstacles for living and being compassionate people. I remember when I was rector of St. Gaspar's School in Chile, one of the, it's a middle class uh, school. A lot of professional people send their, send their children there. And I remember during the time when I was in, especially the pastoral program, uh, it was really hard to talk about the issue of the poor because, well, you know, I would hear all these, uh, these cliché, you know, well, they, all, they had the same, they were born with the same opportunities I was. If they're poor because they, didn't take, like, they did not take care or take advantage of their opportunities or they're lazy, all these clichés we hear, that crosses all the cultures huh? I used to think that was just a Latin American thing, but I hear it up here. I hear it in Europe. It's just something that's there. So I said, you know, I'm tired of listening to all this. Because they were born in an atmosphere, they could have lived their whole life in a cocoon with their relationships, their contacts, their places where they went. I thought, let's come with me. And let's start going to some of these poor areas. And let's meet some people. And so we began a program, this was many years ago, which has continued to develop in many different forms, to that they could actually go and meet people, flesh and blood. And as they did that, they began to, to see things in a different light and be able to relate to them as persons. And it began to change their mentality. And friendships were developed. And it, it just changed the whole picture. We categorize people too easily. But we have to, that contact, that personal contact with others, I think is important if we're going to reach out and touch other people's lives. We have to see the other as a person, as Jesus sees them. I think I said yesterday. I think that was one of the things Jesus had that, that ability to, to look at a person. and He didn't just see the, the woman, in that case of the adulteress, which they were going to stone. He saw something deeper. He just didn't see the woman at the well that uh, came and said, you know, that, uh, and little by little helped her discover uh, the reality, the, 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 her, her true self. He saw something beyond being a Samaritan. The tax collector, when he called him uh, Levi, when he followed him, you know, Jesus saw and could see inside the person what was inside and draw that person out, the best in another. Jesus loved with the heart. St. John says in his first letter, love one another. It's that simple. God is love. Love one another. Jesus, Pope Emeritus Benedict, Benedict XVI said one time, Jesus reveals to us the compassionate face of God. Compassion. God is compassion. One author says, compassion was the wallpaper of Jesus' soul. The wallpaper of Jesus' soul. The contour of his heart. He was who he was. And it's who God is. 
from passion. There's a book by Gregory Boyle, who's the founder of Homebodies Industries in California, he wrote a book called Tattoos of the Heart, The Power of Boundless Compassion. And he says that our compassion needs to find its way to vastness, into the expansive compassion of God, to be in the world who God is. We seek a compassion that can stand in all of what the poor have to carry, rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it. Jesus reveals to us the unconditional, no matter whatness, of God's love. Gerald Thomas Straub, in his book, Thoughts of a Blind Beggar, says, For Jesus, the poor are sacraments because they offer a direct way to encounter God. The poor, broken, rejected, are portals through which we can enter fully into the life of Christ. Christ shows us that mercy is more than compassion or justice. Mercy requires us to become one with the poor and the hurting, to live their misery as though it were ours. In Christ, we see a God so generous, he gives himself a way out of love. Christ moved beyond justice to generosity. Christ's message can be reduced to this. Make every stranger, no matter how poor or dirty, no matter how weak or unlovable, your neighbor. Father Boyle in his book Tattoos of the Heart tells a story about Dolores, the Dolores Mission Church, which is the mission church he attends uh, or he ministers at in California. He said one day when he went to church to celebrate Mass, during the night someone had painted, spray painted on, on the front of the church uh, this is a wet back church. This is a wet back church. In other words, a church for that uh, that receives or gives attention to the immigrants. So obviously, the person who did that was not very happy about that being a wet back church. So Father Boyle later in the day had a meeting with his community. It was a regular session of the community that he had, and he told them the story about how that you know during the night someone painted this on our church, I guess I'll have to get somebody to come in, and some of the homies to come in and, and clean it up. At that point, the lady named Petra Saldan, a normally quiet member of the group, takes charge. You will not clean that up, she said. Oh, I said, I was just in the church uh, not too long, so my Spanish wasn't really perfect yet, and I wasn't quite sure. If I, got, I knew and understood the words, but I, wasn't, I didn't understand what she was getting at. And then she finally said, you will not clean this up. If there are people in our community who are disparaged and hated and left out because they are mojados, wetbacks, then she voices herself on the edge of the couch as though she was going to leave that in. And she says, then we will be proud to be called a wetback church, she said. This woman just didn't want to serve the less fortunate. They were anchored somewhere in the, the depth of her heart. She felt somehow one with them. There was a oneness. As Jesus says, Father, that they may be one as you and I are one. Jesus was not a man just for others. He was one with others. It's different. He just didn't seek the rights of lepers, didn't champion the cause of the outcast. He was the outcast. He just didn't stick up for the rights of the homeless. He had no place to lay his head. Not only did he fight just for the, to improve the conditions of the prisons. I was in prison. So that Jesus did not just center on taking the right stands on issues, but he stood in the right place. 
He stood alongside with. He was one of. Among those who frequent the Dolores Mission Church, there are gang members, there are people who are addicted to drugs, homeless, undocumented immigrants. And an observer once remarked to Father Boyle, you know, this used to be a church. <laughs> and with that tone of voice, you know what he meant. And Father Boyle said he had to restrain himself not to be too strong in his response. But he said, you know, most people around here think it is finally a church. At another meeting, Father Boyle says, we were talking about the variety of smells which one experiences when participating in a liturgy in that Dolores Mission Church. And so he asked, at one point he asked the participants in the meeting, well, what does our church smell like? And someone quickly responded, huele a papas. It smells like feet. <laughs> and Father Boyle said, well, why? And a lady responded, Es nuestro compromiso. It is our commitment. And why would anyone want to commit to that, Father Boyle asked. Porque es lo que haría Jesús. Because it would be what Jesus would do. And so then I asked, so what does the church smell like now? A man stands up and bellows, huele a nuestro compromiso. It smells of our commitment. And then the place cheers. And then finally, Guadalupe is sitting there, she's waving her arms wildly, and she says, huele a rosas. It smells like roses. <laughs> the church roared and applauded. There was a, king, a kinship developed. The smells, you go there, and I guess she still smells like feet. But the way that that smell was perceived changed because the smell of commitment, the smell of relationship. The Beatitudes are not simply a spirituality, it's a geography. Where do we stand? With whom do we stand? If we love what God loves, then in compassion, margins get erased. Be compassionate as God is compassionate. Means dismantling barriers that exclude. So following the footsteps of Jesus, the church is called to compassion. It's called to create a culture of mercy. And this is at the heart of the call of Pope Francis, when he continues to call the church for to be merciful, is one of the recurring themes. Jesus, in that Jesus thing, Jesus, mercy, missionary, get out. <laughs> mercy. We recall, of course, the Good Samaritan, that beautiful story, which is quite challenging. Need is the cry. The cry of the one by the wayside or the cry of that broken world. Wherever need cries forth, we are called to become a person. We are called our geography changes. Sometimes that cry calls us to go where nobody else wants to go. Where do we stand? Do we respond to that cry? Do we hear Abel's blood crying? in so many different ways around us. Pope Benedict in Deus Caritas S. wrote, being missionaries means stooping down to the needs of all, like the Good Samaritan, especially those who are the poorest and most destitute people, because those who love with Christ's heart do not seek their own interests, but the glory of the Father and the good of their neighbor alone. Here lies the secret of apostolic fruitfulness of the missionary that crosses frontiers and cultures, reaches people and spreads to the extreme boundaries of the world. Number three of Deus Caritas says. When I was 
a young seminarian in those days, and this goes back quite a ways, uh, there was a group called Peter, Paul, and Mary, and they had a, uh, an album that was called Songs of Conscience. And there was one song on there, I really, I keep coming back to many times, Home is Where the Heart Is. Where do we stand? Where is our heart? Where do we make our home? And who is invited to enter my home? I remember years ago in Chile one time they said, you know, if you, how was this? Don't say you love elephants if you don't want the elephant to sitting in your living room. <laughs> Where is our home? Who are welcome into our home, into our hearts? Some of you who have been to Guatemala have undoubtedly visited with us. We always take people to Santiago Atitlan to visit a beautiful lake, a volcano. But more than the beauty of the nation, we go there to, to a little shrine. And we tell people the story of Father Stan Rather, a diocesan priest from Oklahoma, a brother of one of our AFC sisters from up in the Midwest. And he worked with the indigenous there. He was from a farm, it was his origin, he was a farm boy. Came a priest, went down there, and he worked alongside the indigenous planting corn and hoeing and, and harvesting. And he just loved the people, they loved him. But because he was so close to them, the military at that time became very suspicious of him. And death threats abounded. And in that area, many people, many catechists had been assassinated. And Stan was under a death threat. And so at one time, he escaped the country. But after he came back to the States, he wasn't here very long. And he began to say, yeah, but this isn't right. I could escape, but there's so many of the people that I loved and have worked with all these years, they're under threat too, and they can't go anywhere. So Father Stan made the decision to go back to Santiago Antipan, to the same place he was, in the same situation. He lived in the rec where we had always lived. The only thing was that every night he would change his room uh, so that it wouldn't be so easy to find if they came looking for him. But he was in the rectory, and one night the, uh, there was a knock on his door, and, uh, and the caretaker, the person he had there working at the rectory, said, Father, forgive me, but I had to tell them where you were, or they would have killed me and all my family. So the military broke into the room and ran to stand. Like I say, he, was, he wasn't just about to give up. He said, here I am. So he fought with them a little bit. Of course, he lost. Uh, they shot him dead there in his room. After that, the family of Father Stan <coughs> wanted his body to be shipped back to the States. And at that point, the indigenous there who, with whom Father Stan lived and worked and who loved him so much, approached the family and said, asked if they could keep his heart. And they did. His heart was removed. And his body was shipped back to the States. His heart stayed there. And they built the shrine in the wall of the church. Home is where the heart is. Stan found a home in the heart of those people. And the addition of people like Iman found a home in Stan's heart. And his heart is there. It's a place where all the assassinated by the military and those who disappear, crosses and put around that shrine where his heart is embedded in the wall of the church. Pope Benedict, in one mission in Sunday's message, said, To live according to God, is, it is necessary to live in Him and of Him. God is the first home of human beings, and only by dwelling in God do men and women burn with the flame of divine love that can set the world on fire. And Paul, this is John Paul II, the 2001 mission 
message said. The future face, or he thought that when he spoke to us missionaries of the precious blood in, in an audience we had with him, the future face of the missionaries of the precious blood must be the face of the crucified Lord who poured out his blood for the life of the world. And Pope Francis, in an interview he gave with Father Antonio Spadaro, says, Structural and organizational reforms are secondary. That is, they come afterwards. The first reform must be the attitude. The ministers of the gospel must be people who can warm the hearts of the people, who walk through the hearts of the people, who walk through the dark night with them, who know how to dialogue and to descend themselves into their people's night, into the darkness, but without getting lost. The people of God want pastors, not clergy acting like bureaucrats or government officials. The Holy Father believes that the ministers of the church need to carry out Jesus' mission by healing, showing mercy, taking responsibility for, and by accompanying, as he emphasizes, all peoples on their journey in imitation of Jesus. To go to the existential peripheries of the church and near there the love and serve God, which I remind you reminded us yesterday, Gasper did. He went to the peripheries of society, to those who were, as the bandits were, rejected. They were enemies of the state. They were living in the mountains. Gasper went to them to communicate, as Pope Francis said, to mirror for them the love and concern of God. He didn't go there to condemn them. He came there with the pronounced Christ crucified. Christ to open his arms for them in love. That began a process of transformation. Daniel O'Leary, in an article that appeared in the Tablet magazine entitled Heart That Speaks Unto Hearts, writes, Because of his big heart, open to God, it is as though something in Pope Francis has broken through into a whole other emphasis regarding the role of the church. A startlingly clear perspective of what incarnation is truly about in the complex world of today. He now looks at the world as an active contemplative who has fallen irrevocably in love with God's poor. In the Gospel account of the healing of the of the paralytic, when they brought the paralytic man, the house was full, and so they ripped off the roof and lowered the paralytic man in front of Jesus. I think that could be a, an image for us, is what is happening and what the Pope wishes to do for the church. We need to rip off the roofs of our church and bring the protective walls we sometimes build around us to let others in, to let the needy, the poor, the hungry, those who are crying in so many different ways, that they might find a home with us in our hearts. Compassion is about a covenant relationship. It's about knowing that we are brothers and sisters. They're not, it's not we and them. It's us together. It's covenant. It's bonding, it's relationship. And the heart is the key to living this attitude of compassion. We need to ask and to pray that we might have a heart that beats like the heartbeat of Jesus. A missionary's heart must be formed in the love of God who was so moved that he sent his only son to become one of us, emptied himself in that condition of being God, to become a slave, to become one with us in all things but sin. What a witness of love. What a witness of God's move to compassion for us. And he lived a life and preached of doing good 
and the cross at the end of his earthly life stands as that supreme sign of God's love. Christ in the cross is the complete realization of love. Once again, we're invited then to return to the foot of the cross to fix our eyes on Jesus, to contemplate the face of the Lord at length. And only in doing so, and this was also a call of, of Pope, uh, now Saint, Saint, I guess you said Pope, Saint Pope John Paul II, when he spoke to us, he said, you know, contemplation is important. He said, contemplate Christ, contemplate Christ, until you can see the face of the suffering Christ in your brothers and sisters. That was a very important phrase we don't always quote. We quote the phrase about going to where no one else wants to go. But contemplation, contemplate Christ until you can see the suffering face of Christ in your brothers and sisters. Until our heart beats with the heartbeat of Christ. That's what we're called to. To fill us with love. To give us God's eyes. Christ's way of looking and seeing. Christ's way of relating. Christ's way of, of loving. That's when we put on Christ. That's when we, there's no longer I who speak, but Christ who speaks in me. There's no longer I who act, but Christ who lives in me. We are baptized, you know, we are getting down into that dial until our very lives have been died, have died in the sense of like dying of cloth until we become Christ. Christ's heart, Christ's hands, Christ's feet, Christ's mouth. Big religious life today and consecrated life of all that dies represents one of the most human and compassionate faces of the church. Again, I'd like to finish quoting a quote I started yesterday from Paolo Dell, a companion of the Ricci, in the New Wine Press. To hear and to respond to the call of the blood, moment to moment in the concrete circumstances of one's life. That's what it means for Al to be a companion and missionary. This will mean sharing the other's joys and sorrows and problems. First of all, by being present to and hearing the other. And then by responding, by trying to be the human shape of God's love for the individual at that moment. It is important to remember that what the other needs is first of all our compassionate, attentive presence. To look into their eyes. To try to look into the heart of the other person. That presence is what will give true human and redemptive meaning to anything we might subsequently do. This being the human shape of God's presence and love in a continuous succession of individual moments takes place in our families, in our neighborhood, our city, state, nation, our world. Our response will take shape based on the circumstance in which we find ourselves. The opportunities and responsibilities presented and the God-given gifts we as individuals bring to that moment. Pope Francis has made mercy a central theme of, his, of the good news. And he says, let yourselves be guided by Jesus' mercy. Go where he goes, among sinners and tax collectors, and learn what it means. I wish mercy and not sacrifices. In our general assembly, we also have, in our vision statement, we say the following. The blood of Christ, poured out for all and drawing all near, is the source and summit of our life and mission. <clears throat> this blood impels us to affirm the dignity of life as we embrace a wounded humanity and creation. May our prayer today be inspired by Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, when he exhorts us, put on the mind of Christ. And as we meditate on the call of Jesus, to be compassionate, to 
with our Heavenly Father is compassion. Home is where the heart is. Where is our home? And who finds a home in our heart? Again, there are some reflection questions which might serve in getting out.
preferred dumping place for death squads. <coughs> uh, the first six months I was in Guatemala, more than 16 bodies showed up on our roads leading to our seminary. You never knew what you were going to find. And I remember one Sunday morning, this is in Santa Rosita at Mass in the afternoon, but one Sunday morning in a little lake which is near our church, uh, three bodies were discovered. They were three young people whose hands had been tied behind their back and who had obviously been executed and dumped into the lake. Later on it was discovered that these were had been prisoners and one of the ways that in the, in the prison they made room for more people was to take some out and just shoot them so they could have space to receive others. These were three young, young men and that was really upset me. And at the, I remember at lunchtime, you know, we were talking at a table with the seminarians, and I said, you know, I think I have to say something about this in my homily today at Mass. Oh, Father, I think, you, you know, you don't want to do that. It's better not to say anything. I wasn't comfortable with that. In the end, when the Mass came, I did speak about violence and the spiral of violence, and that's not the way to, you know, respond to violence with violence, it doesn't get us anywhere. But one thing happened during the Mass, I noticed no one was looking at me, which was very unusual, because I usually had, you know, the contact, everybody was hands down. And then after Mass, I always would go to the back. Of course, there you can sing 20 verses and no one moves until the last verse is sung. <laughs> and then, I went to the back of the church and I would always stand at the door and greet everybody as they left. But that day, as the final song was being sung, one little old lady, Doña Chaguita, who was one of those pillars of the church, you know, that was always there, and just a wonderful, wonderful lady. And she came shuffling up to the altar, I was still on the altar, and she <laughs> took me by the arm, and she led me into the sacristy. <laughs> she led me into the sacristy and she said, Father Pepe, we just, we don't talk about these things in Guatemala. She said, that's just how life is here. But, well, I'm reflecting upon that about what kind of, what an image that is. She led me off the altar and into the sacristy. The world is messy out there. You don't want to get. You don't want to go there. Stay in the sands. That night, I prayed and I said, "Oh Lord, I could understand her because almost every family in that area had lost somebody at some point to violence, and I could understand maybe how people survive in those circumstances. It's like maybe just blot it out." Don't talk about it. But I said, Lord, please, may I never become indifferent to the innocent suffering and bloodshed of others, no matter what. May I never become indifferent. The Holy Father thinks he doesn't want us to be led into the sacristy. The Holy Father says, a missionary heart is aware of these limits, makes itself weak with the weak, everything for everyone. It never closes itself off. Ne never retreats into its own security. Never opts for rigidity and defensiveness. It realizes that it has to grow in its own understanding of the gospel and in discerning the paths of the spirit. And so it always does what good it can, even if in the process, the shoes get soiled by the mud of the street. Gaudium's, Gaudium, Evangelium Gaudium number 45. Even if our shoes get soiled by the mud of the streets. Our provocative statement from the 20th General Assembly states, energized by the vision of the Second Vatican Council and Catholic social teaching, we beckon all the baptized to unite with us 
in living the universal call to holiness and to mission. The universal call to holiness and to mission. When I was a young priest ministering in Santiago, we often would, we began to do parish missions and we formed, a, in the beginning, the mission team consisted of, of sisters, Dorothy, Maria Luisa, Edna, sometimes Carmelita, the Dayton sisters, and myself and some lay people. Eventually, more and more lay people became part of the team as they themselves had formation. And we would always, one of the themes which we had in, the, in the, that mission that we developed was, one of the first things was, we are church. We are church. And it was a theme which we pounded and pounded into the entire week. We always kept coming back. We are church. Now I'm speaking about a time when that wasn't as obvious as it might be today. As it might be today. I think maybe we might know that in theory, but not always in practice. We are church. All baptized people are church. And all of us are responsible for the mission which God has given us. We share in the Missio Dei, we share in God's mission as expressed in Jesus Christ. Now we've grown a lot since then in our understanding of the importance in the participation of all baptized, the Christi Fidelis and many other doctrines of the Church. Pope Francis clearly states in an Evangelium Gaudium, in virtue of their baptism, all the members of the people of God have become missionary disciples. The new evangelization calls for personal involvement on the part of each of the baptized. Every Christian is a missionary to the extent that he or she has encountered the love of God in Christ Jesus. We no longer say that we are disciples and missions, missionaries, but rather that we are always missionary disciples. One of the first mindsets I think that we need to continue to work on to and to change <coughs> in the church, if we are to be renewed, is to really uh, deepen this aspect that all the baptized are responsible for the mission entrusted to us by Christ. The clerical mentality is very much embedded in our church. This is nothing new. We all know that and have experienced that. To change this mentality, and it's a mentality which is not always just a part of the clergy, but it's also a part of many times of the laity. The laity can also have a clerical mentality. Right? So it goes both ways. We all have to work on this and accept our own responsibility. We are all responsible. We are all in mission. When we have been doing our appreciative discernment process in our congregation under the guidance of Father Bill, we've come to the conviction that the responsibility for bringing the vision that we have for the congregation into reality lies with each one of us. We are all responsible for bringing that vision into reality. And we might say Francis has as I said before, in Evangelium Gaudium set forth the vision for the church. But the responsibility for bringing that vision into reality rests with all of us. We can't just sit back and say, well, let's see what the Pope's going to do. He'll do a lot, with all he can. But the real ground, groundwork has to be with all of us. We have to renew the church. And one of the ways, and one of the contributions we need to give is each of us accepting our role in bringing this about. That we are all responsible for the mission and for leadership of the church to bring this vision that we have and share into reality. We also state in our vision statement, every missionary embraces the responsibility of shared leadership for the well-being of the community. Our chosen leaders are servants who can animate us to share our gifts for the realization of our vision and the fulfillment of the reign of God. And what is said of our congregation can be applied to our understanding of the mission of the church. 
The Christian community is, in its essence, a community of disciples. A vocation to ministry involves not just discipleship, but leadership. And it appears to be what Pope Francis is calling us to. In Austria, you know, they're going through uh, much of what we have been going through in the United States about, they have to, like the, the Archdiocese of Vienna has to close, oh, I don't know how many parishes they're going to close. I mean, it's just not four or five, it's, it's dozens that they're going to close over the next few years. And so there's a whole thing, you know, about how is this new vision going and how is this going to, to be? And Cardinal Schoenberg is speaking about, basically, he's speaking about Christian-based communities. About, oh, it's about time <laughs> that our church discovers what we discovered a long time ago in Latin America, the value of Christian-based communities. So he's envisioning a church with less you know, parishes, or parishes comprised of any number of Christian-based communities throughout the city. <laughs> And when we talk about Christian-based communities, certainly our experience in Latin America, it's modeled on, on this shared leadership. It's, it's the church itself in its base, the living stones of the church, or the people who gather together to reflect the Word of God, to pray together. And eventually, as happened in the Christian communities which I accompanied in Chile, little by little, these same people who in the beginning was like pulling teeth getting them to accept their responsibility as Christians to be missionaries. <laughs> but once they get the fire in their belly, they want to do something. They want to get out. I had in the beginning this sort of comment, okay, let's, we, we have to be prepared for this too. We have to prepare, you know, get from formation. But eventually, the lay people, who in the beginning didn't want to leave their apartments, because I worked in a, and lived and worked in an apartment house complex, uh, near the National Stadium. Uh, they didn't want to get out. They said, we have enough problems of our own. We don't need to get involved in the problems of our neighbors. But I just kept going back and back and back until they eventually began to get involved and we had some beautiful communities. And these people, little by little, as they discovered their vocation, their vocation is they to be responsible for the church in that section. And little by little, they assumed all the responsibilities of the church in that area, except, of course, the celebration of the Eucharist and the Sacrament of Reconciliation. They took everything up. They were the church. They were the church and actively participating. So, discover the gifts. Some had gifts to work with the more directly with the poor. Others had gifts to work with the youth. Others had gifts for singing. Others had gifts to, to reach out. And we had formed then eventually a missionary group of lay people. And we went then from our Christian-based communities to mission in other parishes in Santiago who asked for missions, who wanted to go through this process of deep renewal. And believe me, it does renew the church. It's a, a horse of a different story when you get all these lay people in, in, involved directly and enthused. However, at the same time, I have to say, it involves on our part a changing of our mentality because some people could, and some clergy so could feel threatened by this because, yeah, well, this is what I used to do before. Uh, what's my role now? So, luckily, one of the reasons I went to South America as a seminarian, I wanted to go with a clean slate. I didn't have, so I just wanted to grow up there and in that atmosphere. And I'm grateful for that. But, but you know, it means a shift of our mentality. And to help convince the lay people little by little that, yes, this is your church. We are in this together. We are all responsible. We are all leaders. Because as I say, sometimes we, it's our fault too. We foreign people think this way over centuries, you know, that, well, we think of the, the mission of the church as the Pope, the bishops, the priests, the people, the ordained, uh, the sacrament of the ordained. Um, and they've grown up with that mentality. And sometimes they expect 
the lay people expect that because that's the way they mentally didn't inform them. So they have to have also shift and change and accept the role that they have by baptism, the mission they have, and we have to accept also that, believe me, it doesn't mean that the priest doesn't have anything to do. <laughs> and it doesn't mean that the priest is just sac celebrates the sacrament. There is a lot of work involved, especially in formation. But the decision making, the actual work, was all done together as community. Um, you know, over the years, as especially when I was general, I, I assisted at so many uh, different ordinations and celebrations, and, and some things can get pretty elaborate, huh? And some of the banquets and some of the things following us. I hope Francis never had to see any of that because he'd have a few words to say. But, um, I often thought, you know, I'm going to begin to send the newly ordained, at least this was an idea I had. I'm going to, instead of a fancy chasuble or a, a golden chalice, I'm going to send them a wash basin and a towel. And in the package, I'm going to include a card which just says, so that you never forget what it's all about. Service. Humble service. That's what it's all about. But we need to, I think that Francis is embodying for us a living example of this kind of servant leadership. He's not trapped, he's not in that trapping, so we saw that from the day he was named Pope, elected Pope. He wasn't into those, all the fancy garments and everything. His masses are, are quite simple, his vestments, his, his own way of dressing. He stayed in his black shoes, uh, which are the same ones he wore in, some, in uh, Buenos Aires. Um, and the Pope on Holy Thursday, that first Holy Thursday when he celebrated after his election, when he went to the juvenile uh, detention center there in Rome, and he washed the feet of 12 incarcerated young men and women, and even a Muslim, much to the chagrin of Vatican authorities, is giving us an example of certain leadership, what it's all about. He's just showing us, yeah, Let's just live the gospel. Let's get back to the essentials. Pope Francis, in his dialogue with the superior generals last November in Rome, at one point spoke to the superiors about service. He said, we must never forget that true power, or whatever level, is service, which has its bright summit upon the cross. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, but it should not be so among you. Rather, whoever wishes to be great among you shall be your servant. Whoever wishes to be the first among you shall be your slave. For Francis, authority is a service of love. When we think about a missionary model church, we're thinking about a collaborative model in which each gifts of each individual are summoned, they're called forth, to be put at the service of the reign of God. This means, it sort of ties in with one, at least one part of the reflection on shepherds I won't be able, won't get to, but we have to know the people. If the priest is shut up in his office, how is he going to call forth the gifts of the community if he doesn't know the people? If they don't know his voice, and he doesn't know their voice. Again, as the Pope says, get out there. Get your feet dirty. Get those shoes muddy. Walk with your people. Know them. Hear their voice. So that then you can call forth their gifts and talents. And that goes for leadership too in our own and our in communities, in our church communities, in our own uh, religious families. Know your people. Know their.
hear their voice, that they know our voice as well. Every once in a while, these models of church collide. It's, uh, it's not always, you know, just so easy. We know, we have experiences, we, we see and hear and how in some dioceses, perhaps a bishop who has been very much into the collaborative model, calling forth the laity and the participation, might be replaced by another bishop who comes along and dismantles what had already been there. Sometimes I think, what a sin that is. Sin against the people of God. And then, I have, I have my own personal experience, I won't go into detail, but I was working so heavily in Christian-based communities for years, and it took about 12, 13 years to build these things up. And then I was moved on, and my brother who came after me, the first meeting of the Christian-based community, when they all get all the different communities gathered together, one of the persons wanted to say something about, we think that maybe, wait a minute, let's get one thing straight. I am not Father Pepe. I'm the pastor. And I will make the decision. 12, 13 years of calling the people out, committing themselves in one phrase, just wiped it out. We do that to one another. Those are sins that we, you know, we talk about reconciliation. We have a lot to work on in our, in our own selves. That was just my, I'm sure there have been other experiences in other situations. So these visions of, you know, it's not, we, we think that this is something that's a given, but it's not a given in practice. There are still different models out there of how people envision church and authority and service and being a priest and being a lay person. The Pope is calling us to renewal. And I think one of the things we have to, to work on is to share with the people that we are in contact with a spirituality for mission. Spirituality for mission. Um, there's a lot of talk about a lot of people today are looking for spirituality. When you go in these bookstores or online and there's all kinds of books about spirituality. And in Austria, I, mean, I know people, Austrians who don't miss a course and don't miss, I mean, they go to everything that's going on. Um, but it seems like there's a search for some kind of, um, like Coca-Cola light or Diet Coke or Pepsi light, it's just light spirituality. It's something like to make me feel good, something that I'm going to have, you know, there's uh, so much talk about inner healing, which is important, obviously. But it's not just about inner healing. We just can't stay all our lives looking at our belly buttons. Inner healing comes about also through relationships, through contact and interrelating with other people. And sometimes I want to I want to say, I said, you know, you've been I since I've known you, I, you've gone to at least ten different retreats about this kind of spirituality. But I have never once heard the word poor in seven years. I haven't heard the word poor. So you can imagine what that does to me. Um, when's it going to happen? If we keep waiting till we are 100% healed innerly, well, the world will die from hunger, or we'll kill ourselves off in wars in the meantime. <laughs> It has to go hand in hand. There's two legs to this thing, you know. As we work for inner healing, for our own, you know, salvation, but that we also have to be keep working about the salvation of others and the healing of others and the justice and peace and all that involves. <laughs> it just can't be a spirituality of feeling good. In Austria, they have all these wellness centers. You know? So like the spiritual wellness. So you get, you know, all this other stuff, you get your massage, you get your wellness and wellness and wellness. Okay, where's the commitment out there? That's what the Holy Father is saying, get out there. Get out there. 
The world is waiting. The cries are there. All you're hearing is your own personal cry. We need to open our ears, I think, like, like I referred to the, you know, the deaf mute. We need to hear that ephata. Open my ears, Lord, so that I can hear the cry. Open my ears so I can hear the cry. We don't want to hear the cry many times because it's unsettling. It calls us out of our comfort zone. We are called by the blood and sent by the blood. We are called by the blood and sent by the blood. It's missionary. And the spirituality of the blood of Christ is missionary. This kind of wellness spirituality or, or, or this only this type of it's me and God spirituality type thing, I think is one thing that is being called by the Lord to be stretched. And we have the missionary spirituality. The charism of the blood of Christ, I think, is missionary by, by its nature. You all heard and probably tired of hearing about the cry and the call of the blood. But that is captures the sense of being missionary. If we hear the cry of Abel's blood, that blood is calling us to mission. There's the call. Just as in Exodus it says that the God heard the cry of his people and sent the liberator. And the ultimate liberator is Jesus Christ who, lives, who liberates us and frees us by the precious blood of Jesus. If we are missionaries responding to that cry, we will be missionaries. And our vision statement again states, as a courageous community of missionary disciples, the cry of the blood calls us to the edges of society to be ambassadors of Christ for reconciliation and hope as we minister to the people of God. Pope, or, or St. Gaspar said, unlike statues, missionaries are not motionless. They serve wherever God's will, God wills to call them. And I think we deserve God's will for us who are called to be missionary women and men of the precious blood through the blood of Christ, through the cry of blood. We discover our mission and where God wants us to be. Uh, the Holy Father says, he says in different ways, I think he also says it in, I don't know if he says it in Gaudium, they don't give him Gaudium, but he said one time speaking to a group, he said, you know, um, we don't want, well, he was talking to catechists, he said, you know, catechists have to get out there. We don't want any more statues in a museum. We want catechists to get out there on the street and announce God's love. Gasper also said, in my mind's eye at times I see a multitude of workers gradually making their way throughout the entire earth in the whole, with the holy chalice of redemption, offering to God the divine blood. I've often quoted John Paul's words, spoken to the delegates of the General Assembly in 2001, in Costa Gondolfo. Go to where no one else wants to go. Set up. So what I'm saying and what Francis is saying isn't something new but he's putting an emphasis on it. John Paul II said to us missionaries, two centuries later, he was speaking, first he spoke about um, Pope Pius VII who called Gaspar to become an apostolic missionary. Two centuries later, another Pope calls the sons of Gaspar to be equally bold in their decisions and actions and to go where others cannot or do not want to go and to take up missions which appear to have little possibility of success. I ask you to continue your efforts to build a civilization of life, seeking the protection of all human life, from the life of the unborn to the life of the aged and infirm, promoting the dignity of every human being, especially the weak and those deprived of the rightful share of the Earth's abundance. I exhort you to undertake a mission of reconciliation 
working for the construction of societies wounded by civil conflicts, gathering together even the victims and the perpetrators of violence in a spirit of forgiveness, so that they can come, so that they come to see that the blood of Christ is precisely the greatest motive for hope, and even more so, is the foundation of the absolute certainty that according to the divine plan, life will conquer. So whether in our families, parishes, schools, or other areas, wherever we are, we're called to be missionaries and to form missionaries. We are called to help people discover that all are called to mission, and that mission is the responsibility of all of us. That's the commission we receive through our baptism. And I think this is something we have to ask ourselves. How are we forming others for mission? Is that present in our catechism, our catechism? Is it present in our sermons? Is it present when we're preparing youth for confirmation? How can we as missionary women and men, how could we have this missionary mentality which is always there and it should be characteristic of us because it's our charism, it's our gift to help to promote this missionary concept. And I think part of this important part, and we, we say it in our constitutions as a congregation, that important part of announcing the word of God today is not just the word like from the, of the gospel, it's not just the preaching, missions and retreats or Sunday sermons and so forth. But it's also that the Holy Fathers have said, and this that John Paul said, Benedict said, this Holy Father is saying very clearly, the social doctrine of the church is an integral part of evangelization. Integral, not accidental. It's part of what we should be announcing. And I wonder, and I just, I, we have to ask ourselves, how am I making that known? How am I helping people to discover, as some people say, with the greatest secret of the Catholic Church, that we have a social doctrine? It's the best kept secret. Of course, if we start making it known, ah, we'll wait for the criticism. You know, just look what the criticism the Pope received after he talked about, Francis talked about the evils of, you know, unbridled capitalism and so forth, right away. Communist! He's a communist! I thought, gee, I feel like I'm back in South America. Because <laughs> down there, as soon as you talk about the poor, or talk about anything like that, well, you're a communist, you're a socialist. Well, okay, we're going to, get, we're going to have to avoid some of that. But we can't avoid it. It's who we are. It's what, it's what it comes from the gospel. It's the gospel values. So I think we need to contribute from our spirituality, from living um, and being sent to the crime and call of the blood. Uh, we can contribute to this renewal that the Holy Father is calling the church to. By helping other people and, and Evangelium and Evang all these Evangelium, Evangelium vive of John Paul II, when he speaks about the cry of blood, which is where I, you know, where I took off from in many of my reflections, he speaks about the cry. But then he says to all Christians and people of goodwill, make the cry of the blood heard. Make the cry of the blood heard. Well, isn't that for us in a special way? As precious blood people, hear the cry. <laughs> And then make it heard when we hear that cry and call people to respond as Christians in our commitment. That's what we're about. That's what we're called to be. And I think through that, we can uh, really contribute to this renewal of the church. A church which does not stay within itself. It's going to be, you know, like John 21 when when Jesus had died on with Peter, and says, you know, when you were young, you know, you, you went and did what you pleased and went where you wanted to go. When you get older, someone else is going to wrap a, 
uh, tower or a belt around you and pull you to go where you don't want to go, or would you rather not go? I think this is the call. It's a call to conversion. It's a call to, you know, when you Chagwita, you took me into the sanctuary. Thank you very much, but I got to go back out. I'm not going to be at the museum piece in the sacristy. That's not what we're called to be as missionary women and men. We're called to get out there to announce the good news with our word and with our deed. and follow the footsteps of Christ. It is through our living, our mission, in and through the spirituality of the blood of Christ, that we will make our contribution to the construction of this new world, to this new vision, this new Jerusalem, which Pope Francis is calling us to. One which is more human, just, one that reflects more faithfully God's dream for all of humankind. As we go to Jesus, it made possible through the blood of the man. In Evangelium Gaudi, number 27, Pope Francis says, I dream of a missionary option. That is, a missionary impulse capable of transforming everything so that the church's customs, ways of doing things, times and schedules, language and structures can be suitably channeled for the evangelization of today's world rather than for, for her self-preservation. We too dream of a new model of church. We must not sit back and simply expect that that's going to happen from above. Pope Francis can call us to action and he can give us a beautiful example to follow. But we are church. And if the church is to be renewed, then we, the living stones of the church, must be renewed in our own mentality and our way of doing things. By sharing the treasure of our spirituality, we can contribute to the renewal that Pope calls us to and for which the people of God yearns. Yeah,